good evening guys welcome back to your channel an sarkari and i hope that you must be doing great so let's start with our today's discussion from the hindu newspaper which is the sunday's edition so the first topic is regarding the electoral bonds so there are a lot of facts which you should be knowing from the perspective of prelims examination so only the state bank of india is authorized to issue and encash the electoral bonds and only 29 branches of it are i would say to be precise they are authorized then uh, the electoral bonds they are available for a period of 10 days beginning the in every you know the first month of every quarter so the first 10 days of that month you can like buy the electoral bonds and only those political parties that are registered under section 29a of the representation of the people's act 1951 and which have secured not less than 1% of the votes polled in the last general elections or the state assembly elections only they are eligible to receive the electoral bonds so both these conditions must be satisfied in order for a political party to receive an electoral bond so we see that the motive the objective behind bringing behind introducing the electoral bonds was to bring in more transparency in the system of political funding in the country but recently we have seen a study which says that electoral bonds they have been rather used it as an instrument to provide political funding to the political parties via the unknown means so we can say instead of bringing more transparency more uh, you know more transparency in this process of electoral funding the things have rather moved in the opposite direction and you should be aware about different perspectives you should be knowing about these studies from the means perspective and obviously these facts from the pt perspective now let's move ahead we know that local body elections are going on in the union territory of delhi then okay so samruddhi corridor this is from the perspective of infrastructure development in the country so the nagpur shedi stretch of this hindu hridaya samrat ba balasaheb thakre maharashtra samruddhi mahamarg this will be inaugurated on 11th of december by a prime minister so it is going to boost tourism then there are specific locations given uh, so you should be knowing more about them and find out more yourself so the locations includes shirdi verul loner lake which is located in maharashtra then you have ajanta elora aurangabad the district of aurangabad then you have panchwati then jyotirlingas of trimbakeshwar Trimb then you have Grush, uh, grushneshwar and the hill station of igatpuri so these locations they become important when we are talking about such a big development and it is going to pass through three wildlife sanctuaries so the first one is the kartepurna wildlife sanctuary which is located in akola then you have <coughs> sorry <coughs> then you have karanja sol a black fox sanctuary in wasim then you have the tansa wildlife sanctuary in thani so it is going to pass through these three wildlife sanctuaries and you can find out more about the species which are found in these sanctuaries and also find out more about the wildlife institute of india so coming to this news piece it is talking about that we are witnessing a declining patronage in the domestic market for the stringed instrument makers basically tanpura so they are seeking help from the indian council for cultural relations so you can find out more about this organization and this council moving ahead okay so maharashtra becomes the first state in india to set up an independent ministry for the divyangjans so do we need a uh, an independent ministry at the national level at the central level or not is to be a uh, is again a question that needs some deliberation so maharashtra is the first state in the country to come up with such development and this has come up in the backdrop of the international day of persons with disabilities which is celebrated on 3rd of december then we know that was in jaipur this thing is coming every day in news so it is located in the state of kerala 
phone is this much is required okay so coming to the diversity the different practices which are followed by the tribal population of india given the diversity in india the diverse food practices that they follow the diverse knowledge that they have when it comes to healing a certain diseases and also a few days ago we discussed that our president has also emphasized on conserving their their priceless knowledge that they have and prevent that from becoming you know to prevent that from going into oblivion and so we require more steps in that direction so again this news piece is also talking about there are 55 natural food sources of the tribal population uh, in the dandakarnia region uh, and it is on its way to oblivion so it can definitely disappear given the levels of conservation the steps that we are taking in preserving this priceless knowledge so muria tribe it lives in the state of chatisgarh and andhra pradesh and they are found to be you know uh like growing uh, such 55 natural food sources which are believed to contain high nutritional value so one of them is mentioned here that is the mushroom species it naturally grows in the bamboo plantations and then they are later dried and preserved and obviously then eaten so they have high nutritional value so we can connect this thing with the malnutrition problem that india is going through and this can definitely prove to be a great game changer also so we we need to connect things like this and this can be one of the solutions to the malnutrition problem definitely with proper research and development and then encouraging the cultivation of such food species so obviously they however they are growing naturally but we can take a step in the desired direction after proper research and yeah then there are other tribals which are called as kuns then purja then you have muria have already told then there are koyas so this is from the perspective of the tribals then we know that aims was attacked recently it faced a cyber attack so you should be knowing which all authorities are participating in the investigation behind the cyber attack so first is certain that is the indian computer emergency response system then we have national investigation agency then there is national security council secretariat so nia which is mainly focused or focuses more on you know countering the terrorist activities but even that is also participating here because obviously terrorism terrorism can also be an angle in this case moving ahead let's see what is the next thing for us from the science perspective there's a new development when we are talking about the shelf life of stored blood so the institute for stem cell science and regenerative medicine it has come up uh, it, it has developed a new technology which is called the novel blood bag technology and this institute is an autonomous body an autonomous institute of the department of biotechnology so according to this technology basically it is focusing more on increasing the shelf life of the stored blood so the stored blood we know it has finite shelf life and the typically basically the stored cells which produce various extra cellular components which are known as the damage associated molecular patterns they damage the blood cells during the storage so we need to prevent the damps from occurring in the blood which is stored and they have developed a novel approach to basically capture them and remove these damage causing extra cellular components so with this step it is believed that it is going to increase the shelf life of the stored blood by about 25% and the extra cellular components which are being generated they are free iron and free hemoglobin bioactive lipids such as polyunsaturated fatty acids extracellular dna then you have nucleosomes and protein so during the storage these components they interact and they damage the red blood cells so that is the damaging impact which these extra cellular components have on the stored blood and reduces or we can say it 
uh, reduces the quality of the blood that is stored as the time passes by. So the custom designed nanofiber sheets. So these are called the designed nanofiber sheets that can capture such damage causing components. And these can like, these are the sheets which can be made into the blood bags. So basically the time period is also given that 42 days of stored blood leads to the worst quality of the blood after 42 days. And it is going to keep this, this technology or this initiative, this development is going to keep the quality of the blood of the stored blood intact even after 42 days. So that's how crucial it is given less number of blood donations in our country. Now we'll be talking about four uh, animal species here, which are at we are which are facing several threats in our country and are at the risk of extinction or moving more closer towards extinction. We can say so. We'll be looking first at cheetahs. So we know the most important development regarding cheetahs is that there are the Eight Nambian cheetahs have been introduced. They have been brought to India and released in the Kuno National Park of Madhya Pradesh. So cheetah, it had been extinct in India for the past five decades and 8,000 of them, they survive and they're overwhelmingly only concentrated in the countries of Namibia and South Africa. So 8,000 cheetahs are there when we talk about the global population. And when we talk about the Asiatic cheetah, once they are once they were abundant in India, but now they are found in Iran. And talking about the concerns regarding this, uh, the step that we have taken to re again revive the population of cheetahs in India. So the concerns is that. Uh, according to the experts, they say that the Kuno National Park has limited space for the cheetah to coexist with other predators, such as tigers and lions. So that is a concern. And when we talk about the project tiger in India, about its success, so we see that every four years we carry out a census to calculate the tiger population across India. And their population have increased to almost 3,000 and they are increasing at an annual rate of 6%. And their population, it stood at 1,411 only uh, when we talk about the year 2006. So that's how we can say that Project Tiger has been successful in India and revived back the population of tigers. So the Project Tiger was launched in 1973. And the steps that we have taken is that we have come up with more number of dedicated tiger reserves and taken steps like anti-poaching measures to prevent their decline. Now we'll be looking at the Indian rhino and elephants. So Kaziranga National Park located in the state of Assam. Then we have the rhino population. So rhino population, it was only about a dozen. When the Kaziranga National Park, it became a protected area in the year 1905. Only 12 rhinoceros were there. But now, according to the State of Rhino Report 2022, the number has gone up to 2,613. So population has again revived when we talk about the Indian rhinoceros, the one-horned rhino that we talk about. And Kaziranga has the highest density of tigers in the world. So this a project, which was focusing more on reviving back the population of rhinoceros, has also benefited other animals. And because of that, we see that Kaziranga has the highest density of tigers in the world, in the entire world we are talking here. So this can come up in PT. So there are several important facts from the PT perspective in on this particular page. And moving ahead, we'll be talking about, uh, obviously we have taken anti-poaching measures when we talk about safeguarding the population of Indian rhinoceros. So we see that there are, we, we took steps like we increased the manpower, we worked upon building the capacity of the frontline staff and equipping the forest guards with better fighting gears that have helped protect the rhinos. And poaching obviously remains one of the major threats to the rhino population. But now there is 
one more increasing threat that is because of or that is arising out of the increase in the population of invasive plant species. So that is also a threat to the population of rhino and we see that uh, the areas in the past decade, they has emerged as a bigger threat to the animals. So obviously this is in context of the rising invasive species that is again a rising threat to the population, to the rhino population. And elephants, now we'll be talking about elephants. So why are elephants endangered? Now, the population of elephants in India, it stands at 60%. So we are home to Asian elephants. And the number of elephants in India, it has, no doubt, it has increased in the past few years, but it is categorized or it is given the status of endangered species in the IUCN red list of threatened species. And also elephant, it, it is mentioned under the Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. And talking about what are the challenges faced by the elephant population in India, they, they face the threat of poaching, then there is conflict with humans. So these are two main things which we are concerned about when we are talking about the population of elephant. So we see that incidents because of Incidents uh, leading to poaching occur because of the ivory, the teeth that is there, the animal tooth. So, however, such incidents, they have come down, but we see that the human-elephant conflict they ha that has increased. Now, talking about the population that is the habitats of elephant, they are scattered all over India and the population is not uniformly distributed. So the South Indian states of Karnataka, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, they are home to nearly 44% of the India's elephant population and threats includes fragmentation of their habitats. Second is the construction of linear railways and roads, then the power infrastructure that have led to many elephant deaths, and also change of land use, uh, shifting more of forest areas to agricultural activities, deforestation. So that is the major threats faced by elephants. And we launched uh, the project elephant in 1992 and also, we have taken steps, again, added more number of uh, elephant reserves in India, which stands at 32. And the latest addition is the Augusta Mala Elephant Reserve in 2022. And also, we have built 101 elephant corridors. So these are the steps that we have taken. As far as elephants is concerned, now we'll be talking about the Great Indian Bustard. So a few days back, we talked about that Supreme Court is asking the government to come up with project Great Indian Bustard on similar lines as we had project tigers. So again, the Great Indian Bustard population is declining and they are categorized as critically endangered under the IUCN status. So the greatest threat faced by the population of the Great Indian Bustard is the power transmission lines. So earlier also, Supreme Court took up this issue and it said to convert the overhead cables onto the underground power lines, but uh, the things they have not been implemented on the ground and we see that it is said it said that till the time the power lines they are not converted into underground power lines we need to bring up the time uh, we need to bring up the diverters that would have to be hung from the existing power lines so that the death do not the number of deaths do not increase in future and talking about the conservation steps that we have taken so they are listed under the schedule one of the indian wildlife protection act under appendix one of the sites convention and are uh, categorized as critically endangered so talking about the uh, rate of decline of the population it has declined by 75 percent in the last 30 years so historically the population it was distributed among 11 states in the western india but today the population is confined mostly to two states that is rajasthan and gujarat but however small amounts of population is found in states like maharashtra karnataka and andhra pradesh and the overall population today it stands at only 150 across the country so we need to take steps quickly and ensure that 
they do not become extinct species as it happened with cheetahs. Now let's see from the business page. So talking about the potential of growth in India's pharma sector, it can it is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 12%. Currently, it stands at $50 billion, out of which it's like 50%, that is $25 billion, is, uh, is the export market. So half of it is exported, and the, the experts, they are advising, they are suggesting for setting up a separate pharma ministry because the sector is going to grow at a, such a faster rate or with such a huge size. So it definitely needs some regulation and proper management and planning and control. So that's why they are advising, suggesting a separate ministry. Now let's move on to the Financial Express. In Financial Express, what do we have? So... Navy, it is going to open all its branches for women from the next year. So let's see whether is it going to happen or not. But a step in the right direction when we talk about women empowerment, increasing the role of women in all the spheres. And so we are celebrating our Navy Day on December 4th to commemorate its daring attack on the Karachi Harbour and its decisive victory in the 1971 Indo-Pakistan War, which was about the Bangladesh Liberation War. And also we're talking about the growing concerns when we talk about our maritime security. So we are keeping, the Indian Navy is keeping a vigil over the movements of various Chinese military and research vessels when we talk about the Indian Ocean region. Then uh, also greater emphasis on the criticality of the maritime security is being focused upon as India marches ahead. So let's see what else do we have. Talking about Millet's Smart Nutritive Food Conclave that is happening and we are focusing, we are concentrating, we are emphasizing more on the importance of millets and the year 2023 is going to be the International Year of Millets being celebrated by United Nations and India being the largest producer of millets in the world is rightly emphasizing on it and we should be knowing about APEDA which is the Agricultural and the Processed Food Products Export Development Authority and there are several varieties of millets like we have pearl millet, little millet, kodo millet, then barnyard millet, then sorghum and the finger millets. So India the Indian millets, they are a group of nutritionally rich, drought tolerant and mostly grown in the arid and semi-arid regions of India. So given we are focusing, like we are right now, we are cultivating so much of water, like water intensive crops, like we have rice. So that's why uh, the, you know, cultivation and the promotion and encouraging the growth and the cultivation of millets is it, it becomes important given that India is also a water stressed country and they are also nutritionally superior. So again, they they can play important role when we talk about dealing with the malnutrition and they are considered or they are superior to wheat and rice as they are rich in protein, vitamins and minerals. So they are nutrition they are nutritionally superior to rice and wheat, but People lack the awareness, they lack the knowledge about it. They consider as they consider, you know, eating or even cultivating millets as a poor man's food. So they are also gluten free and they have a low glycemic index. So making them ideal for people with celiac disease or even diabetes. So India is one of the top millet exporters in the world. So so much of crucial information when we talk about PT and if this can even be written in mains. While you substantiate your arguments, so that's why millets, you should also read more about their benefits and try to increase your intake of millets. So talking about STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. So what are the advantages of promoting STEM among the children? So it leads to developing their analytical 
skills, their analytical bend of mind and reduces their screen time. Obviously, it has grown so much, so it can shift their attention towards more productive things. Then it, it also, it's a hands-on learning approach when you're using the scientific, the devices and learning. Then it also builds on your problem solving skills. And also it is also a box to take creativity to the next level, build meaningful projects to solve real life problems. So most of us, we are aware about what can be the advantages of it, but we are not uh, you know, aware about what can be its disadvantages. So disadvantages firstly is that if the children, they are not getting instructions in their first language, that is their mother tongue, then they might face some problems in understanding the things that are being explained. So that is one of the concerns. And obviously we are focusing so much on promoting the mother tongue, the mother language, when we talk about the new education policy also. And the second challenge or the second disadvantage is or the lack of experts or the parental guidance to properly teach the logic of using the STEM toys. So that is the another concern. So Navy Day and we're celebrating it on 4th of December. So you can go through this entire page uh, on your own once because uh, important information is mentioned. And we'll be looking at what is MQ-90 Sky Guardian. So it has been developed by the General Automics uh, Aeronautical Systems. And it is basically using critical intelligence. It can be used for surveillance. It can be used for reconnaissance missions and including the surface and subsurface surveillance, disaster response, search and rescue and maritime law enforcement. So these are several uses to which this new development, new technology can be put to use. And it is going to be flown by a crew composed by remote pilot. So we can say it is a UAV that is unmanned aerial vehicle and a sensor operator connected via the geostationary satellite link. So it can directly be controlled from the ground. And you can see BrahMos, which is, we'll be talking about here. So it is the world's fastest cruise missile system, and it is capable of engaging targets at supersonic speed. And talking about crucial development in India, crucial achievement that we have made is that India has been successfully, it has been successful in induction of the BrahMos in all the three services. and. We are the only country in the world to complete the supersonic cruise missile trial. So it can be fired from land, sea, and air. So this completes our supersonic cruise missile trial. And you can find out more about the role of DRDO when we are talking about our defense capabilities. And uh, our naval force is ranked at seventh in the world. Talking about the new navies in science. So the Navy's motto, which is the Sam no Varuna. And talking about uh, the new ensign, which you can see in front of you. So basically the golden border surrounding the national emblem, it draws inspiration from the seal of the Indian Emperor Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj and depicts steadfastness. So you can see this golden border around this octagon. Then the octagonal shape of the national emblem, it has been designed to represent the eight directions symbolizing the multi-directional reach and multi-dimensional operational capability of the Indian Navy. So this is the significance of our Indian Navy's new ensign and you should be knowing about this. This can be asked in uh, PT and also in interview as well. So this is it for today. I hope you've enjoyed and learned new things today. And thank you for joining Ansarkari. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the like button and share the video as much as possible. Thank you so much.